Hello and welcome to the AI Essentials for Product Managers session at Perceive 2021. My name is Alfredo Ramos and I'm the Senior Vice President of Platform at Clarify. I'm responsible for product as well as research and development and marketing. Today I'll be sharing some of the basics of AI, particularly around deep learning. I'll go through some of the most common use cases and focus around classification and detection, which you'll know what they mean by the end of this session. I'll also give you a series of examples for each use case. I won't assume any significant prior knowledge, so this is a great place to get started on your AI journey. My goal is that you leave today feeling like you have a better intuition around some of the deep learning tools you can use for your own AI applications. But first, let's level set around what we actually mean by deep learning. On the right, you'll see a diagram that talks about AI and the subset of AI. AI broadly refers to helping machines be intelligent. Machine learning is a specific subset that usually deals with structured data to make predictions. You can think of this as algorithms that can take rows and tables in a database and they can get insights out of it. So for example, you can use a structured data machine learning algorithm to predict the lifetime value of a user or perhaps You've experienced this before when you go into a site like Amazon and uh, it shows you the product you're most likely to purchase. Those types of predictions are fueled by structured data. Deep learning, on the other hand, refers to algorithms that ingest and process unstructured data like text, images, video, and audio. These algorithms tend to be a bit more complex because they deal with heavy data like unstructured data. Uh, data scientists in data science most often work with the structured data side with databases and getting insights out of databases. And increasingly we're seeing that not only data scientists but also developers are the ones that are building applications that leverage deep learning to take unstructured data and transform it into structured data. And this is very important. The amount of data in the world will grow to 163 billion terabytes by 2025. And actually 90% of this data is unstructured. So the heaviest data, image, video, audio, and text is what is consuming most of the data in the world. And so far, so we haven't had the tools to truly get intelligence out of it. And so this is where Clarify comes in. We are a deep learning platform for unstructured data like image, video, audio, and text. Let me talk to you a little bit about um, how you actually create and train a deep learning model. Well, you start by collecting all of your images, your video, your text, and your audio. Uh, you bring these into your working environment, which could be a laptop or an environment like Clarifies, and you start to label that data. Uh, once you've labeled the data, you need to manage it, search through it, get it into a good spot so you can run training algorithms, and ultimately you can evaluate your training models. Once your models have been trained, you're able to start running predictions on them. And using those predictions, you're able to get a feel for whether the model is performing as you would want it to, as you would expect it to. Oftentimes, this is an iterative process. So you run predicts, you see how it's performing, and then you start again. You go back to the beginning, uh, you see where the model gaps uh, exist, where there's areas where the model can improve, and you add more input data to cover those gaps. You label that data, you train it again, and you predict an eval uh, to the point that after a few iterations, you feel like uh, your model is performing where it should be. Now, Clarify, we have tools for every step of this deep learning lifecycle, ranging from being able to automatically label data as it's added to our system. Uh, we have significant number of tools that use our own machine learning algorithms or your own third-party models to be able to automatically label the data that you're using to build your models. And this cuts down from all of the manual intensive work that can, sometimes can come with uh, having to label data, having machines do as much as possible and only giving humans uh, those data that machines uh, need some help on. Uh, we have a product called Spacetime Search, which lets you search through this very heavy unstructured data. Again, uh, it's not easy to search through uh, large files that are, um, that, that are, that are heavy in nature. And so uh, we have a lot of intelligence to index that data in multiple different ways and then make it possible for you to manage all of that all within the Clarify ecosystem. 
Uh, we have multiple different algorithms for training using state-of-the-art model architectures, uh, both from um, by being able to train the entire model, every layer of the model, to being able to use transfer learning to quickly create um, high-performance models with very few inputs and in very little time. Think of it as um, transfer learning is kind of like teaching an adult brain uh, new capabilities because you're quickly able to pick something new up, whereas uh, deep training, where you're training through every layer of the model, it's kind of like teaching a baby uh, or a child uh, to learn new things, and you have to give it many more examples so that it's able to learn things. Uh, but once your model is trained, we, we put together a series of tools to ultimately scale uh, the predictions from your model. You're able to, using Armada, run predict on any type of model that you have, and you can do so whether you've got tens of hits a day or billions of hits a day, our architecture is able to dynamically scale uh, to the number of nodes that you need to handle your load. And when load goes down, it automatically scales down. We then have some capabilities around building workflows called mesh. And this helps you put together more complex uh, sets of models that can operate in, uh, in what's called the model graph. And in this case, you're able to do things like detect uh, cars in some video, and then for each car that's detected, you're able to run it through another model and classify that. And you'll know what this means in a bit more detail as I get into it. So first, let me take a couple of minutes to walk through what are the most common use cases in uh, deep learning. And for the purpose of this conversation, I wanted to break it down into online use cases and offline use cases. Uh, online use cases are those that are typically powered by some kind of internet enabled application. And offline use cases can be more about using video streams and audio streams to get intelligence out of the real world. Uh, and so I'll talk about a little bit of those, but we classify the categories for online into two broad streams. One, it's dealing with uh, streaming content and moderating content. And the other is generally being able to organize and recommend content based on uh, the inputs that you're seeing and the models that you have trained. Now, a very common uh, use case can range from uh, moderating content uh, to transcribing audio from audio to text, uh, translating text from one language to another, uh, generating metadata for your inputs, uh, running visual search, analyzing documents, and recommending products. I'll walk through some of those examples in the next couple of minutes. And in the offline world, you can imagine or picture a, a video camera that's uh, pointing at uh, your facility, and you can use the video camera to ensure uh, your facility is safe. Uh, you can do things like uh, being able to detect whether there is a fire or whether uh, there's an active shooter. Uh, whether the number of people in a particular space is uh, within uh, OSHA limits uh, and so on. And increasingly people are using face recognition also uh, to add security to a physical space. But this actually really is also used in the online space where increasingly people are using face recognition to, for example, automate the process of applying for a new bank account uh, and things like that. Now, the last category is called sustainment and supply chain. And here we think about how to use AI uh, to um, maximize the, the, your operations and the uptime in your operations or the issues that you find throughout your operations. I'll give you a bit more intuition around that as I get into it. So first, let me give you a bird's eye view into what classification is. And here on the right, you see an image. And what classification would do is a classification algorithm would tell you what is in this image. So for example, here you see uh, a dog, a cat, and you may even see things that are not so physical like friendship. And so you can build AI models that classify the content of an input, like an image, uh, into uh, things in this case, like the probability that there's a dog in there, a cat, or friendship. It doesn't answer the question of where in the image is a particular object, how many objects are in a particular image, and what the size of the object or each individual object is. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. There are some common use cases here. Uh, including metadata generation, content moderation, visual search, and document and media analysis. Let me walk you through a couple of those. All right, so what I'll do is I'll introduce each use case for the slide, and then I'll show you a demo. So first, let's cover metadata generation. Metadata generation is a technique you're able to use to extract metadata out of um, images, videos, documents, etc. And so let me show you a quick use case of how this could be done. So what you're seeing here 
uh, right now is my dashboard on Clarify. Um, below are a number of different applications that have built in over the years. Now, an application is um, essentially a project, right? And so like any project, um, it has uh, API keys that you're able to use um, to give access to uh, the functions within your application. You're able to invite collaborators. Um, and also we have um, a series of capabilities attached with, for example, the default language to use for this application, the base workflow, which we'll talk about in a second, and a, a, a few more pieces of data. Now, this particular application uh, was a furniture classifier. And so imagine that you're building an e-commerce marketplace for travel. First thing that I'll do is I'll show you how you're able to uh, use these uh, models or a general model to be able to get intelligence out of your images. So for example, right now, I'm going to run a workflow that's powered by what we call our general model. Our general model is a model that is able to recognize about 10,000 concepts in the real world. And so in this case, it's analyzing this image and it's coming back and it's telling us here on the right, that, this, that there's furniture, that there's beds, likely a hotel room. In fact, it's 100% sure it's a, it's a hotel room, uh, likely a bedroom, it's indoors and so on. And we're able to do this on any image, right? And so here you'll see that there's furniture, there's a, a chair, uh, some seats, a rug and so on. And so without actually having to do anything, you can imagine that you are able to build a model that is able to um, start to tell you about the contents of this imagery. And why is this important? Well, in the case of um, e-commerce websites, one of the things you may wanna be able to do is to search through the contents using some of this metadata. And so now that we've taken the content and we've transformed it into metadata, one thing that you would be able to do is you'd be able to do things like uh, type uh, or search based, search for any image that has in this case, a chair in it. I'm gonna show you some of the search results, but as you can see, it starts to bring up any imagery that has uh, chairs inside it. And that is very useful. Every single image that was in our system was indexed by the results of this general model that I showed you. What does that mean? As you were adding images, we were automatically applying the general model to every single image, and we are able to take the metadata that's returned from that model and we're able to index your data so that right out of the gate, without really having to do anything, you're able to search for things like uh, chair and sofa and table and any of those things that are commonly appearing inside your model. And that's very powerful, especially if you're doing something like building a uh, visual search application. The next example that I wanted to show you was deep content moderation. And here you're able to use AI models to moderate user-generated content, be it uh, images, video, and even text. And the idea here is to filter out unwanted content from images such as nudity or drugs, weapons, and from text, uh, you may wanna uh, flag profanity, racial slurs, hate speech, um, and then, this type of capability is actually really important because with the amount of user-generated content in the world skyrocketing, uh, moderation has become a must-have for brand safety. Uh, companies do not want to associate their brand to negative content and they use techniques like content moderation to be able to flag unwanted content. Let me show you how this works. In this case, I have another application. It's a visual moderation application and I've uploaded a number of images. And what we're going to see is how the AI here is able to tell you, uh, in this case, it's telling you that the, the, the imagery here is suggestive. Uh, actually, there's a low chance that it's explicit. It may be safe uh, to post, but uh, we're able to not only tell you whether there's unwanted content, but we can tell you whether there's content that's perhaps pushing the line. In this case, uh, we're seeing uh, what appears to be gore. Uh, and this model currently, uh, for your own eyes, uh, we're only showing gore in at, at a fish market. Uh, but similarly, if there was gore uh, with uh, humans or animals or any um, undesirable content, we'd be able to filter that out and you'd be able to use these models to uh, prevent your audience from having to see that. And here's a couple more examples of uh, content that uh, is uh, safe um, 
Uh, and in this case, we're, we're calling out there's a likely drug paraphernalia inside the symmetry. I will show you how you're able to do the same thing, classifying in this case, uh, not uh, the type of content that's happening in an image, but I'll show you also that you can do the same thing on text. Uh, Clarify has a series of uh, natural language processing models. Uh, and in this case, what we're seeing is we're running an, a moderation model that is able to take uh, the text that you have in your, in your content and it's able to classify it based on whether it sees identity hatred, uh, whether there's a threat, whether there's obscenity, insults, toxic content, or maybe even severely toxic content. In this case, uh, it's not finding anything, um, but you could imagine that if we were to do a different type of um, example, which I, I, I'm not gonna call out or read out, uh, you'd be able to find uh, toxic, obscene insults, and you're able to automatically filter that out uh, using uh, AI. In fact, I've started to give you a little bit of a sense of what you can do with a broader category, which is called uh, document analysis. And understanding documents using automation is a critical piece to uh, organizing your content. NLP can be used to categorize your documents in multiple different ways. And at Clarify, you're able to build custom models to do that. Uh, and we also have a series of pre-trained models that you could use to get you off the ground pretty quickly. Uh, so uh, from one perspective, you're able to take a document and it's able to come back and tell you, for example, the topic within that document. Um, but also you're able to do a technique called named entity recognition, which I'll show you. But it's almost like uh, detecting key uh, entities within your document. So if you want to uh, extract out um, people or locations, you can do that using named entity recognition technologies. And I'll show you how to do that. So here I've uh, taken an application where we've added tons of different abstracts that were downloaded from archive.org. And these are uh, documents that range from multiple different topics, including biology, chemistry, and computer science, and so on. And we've actually uh, built, um, uh, because we had the labels for all of these pieces of documents, uh, we were able to build and train a model. And so actually, let me show you a little bit about that for a second. Um, anytime that we train a model, we, are, we automatically run some level of evaluation on it. And so we automatically are able to put together evaluation metrics uh, for this model. And this is important because uh, for all those uh, quant focused people, you're able to look through and get a sense of the general accuracy of your model. In this case, uh, the model is performing quite well with an overall accuracy of 94 based on the test set. And then, then you are also able to see um, multiple different types of matrices to show you uh, the concepts that are predicted. Uh, and in these types of uh, um, views, you want to be able to see a pretty thick line around it. And here it's telling you um, the prediction with the predictions for any particular type concept and uh, how well it's doing. And similarly, you're able to see a co-occurrence uh, matrix where you're able to get a feel for um, not only where physics documents may appear, but also where they seem to have co-occurrence. So for example, physics and chemistry seem to go hand in hand quite often. Similarly, statistics and finance seems to, seems to come uh, together pretty often. And then we uh, automatically generate uh, precision recall and ROC curves for every single concept. And so you're able to go through that and again, quickly develop a feel for how well your model is performing. But let me give you a sense of um, some of the different things you can do to understand uh, the document. All right, so here we're showing um, a, an abstract from a research paper that talked about uh, microeconomic models. So clearly this is either going to be a topic on around statistics or finance, Actually, if you go through uh, income distribution um, and other uh, of these terms, this model has predicted that we're talking about a statistical uh, document. And uh, let's just take um, uh, one more example. Uh, in this particular case, we are looking at a model that's talking about uh, financial time series. It brings up the Warsaw Stock Exchange. And so clearly it is a financial document. 
but we can actually go further. In this case, what we've done is we've applied a named entity recognition workflow. And what this does is it scans the document, it breaks it up into tokens, and it classifies each token into the type of entity that it is. So for example, in this particular case, it's found that it's talking about the United States and it correctly assumes that this is the location. Similarly, it's, it's found the US acronym. And within this context, it is telling us that this is a location as well. Uh, similarly, uh, it calls out the Census Bureau, which it identifies as an organization. Let me do uh, one more example. Okay, so in this case, uh, we've called out uh, the Warsaw Stock Exchange as one organization. Uh, Europe is cor correctly identified as a location. And here it's telling us that Hearst is likely a person. And so what I showed you was different techniques you're able to use on top of documents to be able to understand the content of the document, categorize those documents, and then extract entities out of the documents. Names entity recognition starts to get into what feels more like detection. Detection answers the question, where is something in an input? In this case, an image. On the right side, you see a very cute picture of a dog, a couple of kittens and a duck. And, uh, and so this uh, detection, a detection is not only able to tell you what is in the document, but it's also able to tell you where in the image it is. So for example, here, the cat is on the left, the dog's on the right, and there's a dog in the middle. And these are commonly used for a number of different use cases, including demographic analysis, predictive maintenance, and site safety. So let me give you a feel for that. First, I'll walk through uh, how you can use AI for deep demographic analysis. Uh, the goal of demographic analysis is to try to understand the gender, the multiracial, and the age appearance across images and video. And you can do this to, for example, get deeper insights into the user-generated content that your users are uploading. Uh, or perhaps you wanna be able to get an understanding of the in-store traffic mix. What is the apparent racial mix of the people that are coming in? What is the gender mix of the people that are coming into your store, et cetera? So let me give you a couple uh, examples of how this works. Here we have an application where I've uploaded a number of um, images uh, with people's faces. And what we're doing in this case is we're using our demographics model. Here underneath, you're able to see that the demographics model is made up of five unique models. The first model is a face detector. What it does is it looks through the image, it scans it, and it tries to find any face. The next one is the margin cropper. And what we've done here is we've taken the faces that it detected and we added 10% additional padding uh, to get a really good fit around the face. And then we're gonna take every one of those faces that it detects and we're gonna run it through three additional models. The first is a multicultural appearance model, which tries to guess uh, the ethnic appearance of a person. And again, uh, AI can't tell you what the, uh, what the ethnic background actually is, but it can tell you um, what it looks like. The gender appearance similarly is telling you whether it's a masculine looking uh, person or a feminine looking person. And then the age appearance tries to uh, categorize these faces into different age groups. And as you can see in this particular case, it was able to guess that the uh, um, people's individual uh, ethnic backgrounds. It correctly ad identifies the gender of every single person, or at least the gender appearance. And similarly, it tries to identify uh, the age appearance. And in every one of these cases, it's giving you a probability that, for example, the age appearance of uh, the person being light highlighted here is between 20 and 29 years old. And it says that there's about a 60% probability of that being the case. And you're able to do this uh, very easily across multiple different types of imagery. And uh, in fact, sometimes people use this also to just count the number of people. Uh, if you're able to see people's faces, then you're able to count them as well. And this is um, an interesting exercise. The next thing I wanted to uh, show you was uh, predictive maintenance. So predictive maintenance is uh, the ability to use uh, artificial intelligence and visual techniques in this case 
to anticipate equipment issues before they interrupt. And so uh, rather than having your equipment fail and interrupt your operations, you're able to use these sets of technologies to reduce downtime in your equipment. And in doing that, reduce the cost of maintenance uh, and uh, hopefully in speed up the process of manual inspection. Let me show you a demo of how this could be applied. In this case, we've built together a couple of different models. Uh, one is what's called a streak detector. And what we've done here, and you're able to start seeing um, some of the model predictions, is we've trained the model to detect when there's like paint streaks inside. What, and you may not be able to tell, but this is actually the carcass of a plane. And so we're able to apply these things to quickly uh, detect where there's panel streaks, where there's fastener streaks. And this is a useful way to visually identify where errors could be occurring. But actually, um, one of the things you find is that while this RGB imagery works okay, one of the things that we learned over time is that infrared technology can be used to, uh, to predict streaks. And so we actually uh, built an infrared detector. And so this was actually built using um, infrared images, but here we're more easily able to detect potential issues. And so we flag areas of concern automatically by looking at the infrared and trying to identify uh, where there could be areas that need to be looked at and, and, and notifying people uh, to, to look into any potential issues. Okay, the last use case that I'm gonna be showing you is site safety. And site um, safety really refers to the ability to take a video stream and layer AI on top of it to make sure that your physical spaces are safe. Uh, you can do this in multiple different ways. You could use it to control access to a space using facial recognition technologies as perhaps second factor authentication. Uh, you can make sure that people are not going into areas that they shouldn't be going into. Uh, you can count the number of people that are in your physical space to make sure that you're uh, sticking within the maximum amount in a particular space. Uh, and you're also even able to identify whether people are wearing protective masks or in industrial scenarios, protective equipment to make sure that they're safe. So let me give you a sense of how some of these things can be applied. In this application, I've added imagery of particularly dense spaces. So what we've done in this application is we've added people detection workflow. And what this model is doing is it's attempting to detect the number of people that are apparent in the field of view. In this case, it takes every single person that it's able to detect. And commonly people then use this to count the number of unique people in a particular space. And so for example, in a pool area, you may not be able to have more than hundred people. People detection capabilities can be used to detect the number of people in a space and say, make sure that things are uh, not that dense. And here's another uh, view from that same pool where in this particular case, we're analyzing an image and we're telling the system or returning back the number of people that are particularly viewable in this image. So this is what's called people detection. And hopefully you start to develop an intuition around how you're able to use AI capabilities for site safety. This concludes uh, the demos that I had prepared for you today. I hope you found them useful. So let me take a couple of minutes to summarize what we talked about today. The fact is data is growing at an unprecedented pace and the amount of unstructured data in the world that is not being leveraged is way too high. Enterprises are increasingly adopting AI to gain intelligence from the data that matters the most. There is a caveat. There are simply not enough data scientists in the world to build AI into their applications. And that's why Clarify is building very accessible technologies that can be used not only by data scientists, but importantly, developers, and even no-code operators to build AI capabilities into the critical workflows for their business. There are so many different use cases for AI, and the world needs people like you to propel software 2.0, which is the next generation of AI-powered software. I had a great time sharing some of this stuff with you today. I hope you found it useful and that you enjoy the rest of your day here at Perceive 2021. Thank you very much.